It varies depending on the population of the state. Next, we come to the executive or administrative branch, central to the three pillars form of government established as the foundation of the U.S. Democratic Republic. The elected chief executive, the U.S. President, has a state-owned residence on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. to serve as their headquarters and base of operations during the duration of their elected term. It has only been recently that the number of four-year terms a single person can serve as president was limited to a total of no more than two consecutive or back-to-back -back terms. The role of the executive branch is to sign and pass or veto and reject the laws proposed as bills by the two houses of Congress. They also have the power, according to the Constitution of the USA, to pardon criminals and appoint federal judges. The executive administration, including an elected president and VP, along with the president's cabinet of appointed officials, serves terms of four years each and can only be elected into office two times in a row. Finally, the last column or pillar of a democratic republic form of government is the legislative or judicial branch. The Supreme Court of the U.S. has nine lifetime serving chief justices who serve a term until they die, are fired, or retire from office. Here is the Supreme Court of the United States Building in Washington, D.C. Inside these halls of justice are decided causes regarding the constitutionality of laws and cases seeking to appeal for overturning prior rulings of lesser courts. The role the Supreme Court plays in the democratic republic form of government is as a check and balance with the other two branches, the congressional and executive. Just as only certain duties can be performed by one branch of government, so too can others be performed solely by another, and so on and so forth, such that all the player pieces in the figurative political chess game remain constantly in check against all others. This delicate political equilibrium is called democracy. Thus, the three branches of a democratic republic form of government all equally support and counterbalance one another. Aside from providing calisthenic resistance that keeps pressure on each and keeps all those within these three branches from becoming overly powerful through extraction from another of the right to have power over them, the three branches of a democratic republic form of government are parallel lines that do not intersect. The Founding Fathers, who were also Freemasons, were quite clever and fully aware of the impact and significance of such a three-branch system of government. Thus, they drafted three documents, each of which serves as a guideline to one of the three branches of the Democratic Republic U.S. federal government. The first document our Founding Fathers wrote was the Declaration of Independence by the American Colonies from Great British Rule. The Declaration of Independence boldly and in no uncertain terms airs the list of American colonial Freemasons with rule by the tyrant King George III, comparing their contemporary situation to the reformation of Martin Luther when he nailed his list of his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany over 250 years before. At least 15 of the 26 co-signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. The American colonialist Freemasons' second order of business was to create a form of government, from scratch, that could fulfill all the requirements necessary to achieve prolonged national sovereignty in the form of conducting international trade and commerce in accordance with the agreed-upon preconditions for statecraft. The Constitution establishes the three branches of a democratic republic as the foundation for the government of the USA and sets copious limits on the duties and ex officio rights that may be taken on by each. Considering it was written by sovereign individuals, who could very well have left the whole endeavor to go to anarchy, and considering it attempts to achieve the idealist goal of democracy, a goal not sought since the end of the Roman Republic when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon and was declared Imperator for life.
28 of the 40 signers of the U.S. Constitution for a Democratic Republic form of government were Freemasons. The next piece of paper these American colonial Freemasons set about drafting up was meant as a list of laws protecting any and all sovereign individuals from abuse of state authority by any government official. The amendments to the Constitution are continually written up, vetoed, or added to this day. Because it remains a document capable of revision and change, aside from in its most core functions, some claim the Bill of Rights serves as an open door for making constitutional amendments. The Bill of Rights is originally a list of inalienable human rights given to us by our divine creator that must be upheld and protected by any form of state copying this model of democratic republic government. Protected by the U.S. constitutional government are the rights of free speech, free practice of religion, and free right to public congregation. Further protected is the right to own guns, mentioned explicitly in the Second Amendment as a necessary precaution to allow the citizens to guard themselves against government, excesses, or abuse of state authority. The right to own property in the form of land, goods, and services, including intellectual properties such as writings and records, are expounded upon as well and more rights can be added to this list indefinitely in the form of additional considerations of what constitutes human rights. All these concepts spring forth fecundly from the three branches model of a democratic republic form of government. Aside from lacking odd numbers of elected officials in most of the governing bodies, aside from the nine-member Supreme Court, the only thing that could be wanted more from this model is direct democracy whereby the citizens themselves would cast the total number of votes not only for elected representatives, but also on political issues such as the ratification of bills into laws or overturning of Supreme Court decisions, ratifying constitutional amendments, appointing officials such as the presidential cabinet, etc. This concept of even further extended democracy depends, however, on limiting the authority commanded by each of these offices and thus the powers of them all. The three-branch model of a democratic republic form of government is an ingenious invention that can effectively limit the scale and scope of state authorities' invasion into the sovereign individual's personal life. By having three parallel systems that support one another rather than any other branch additional to them, but that otherwise do not intersect, the system of checks and balances proposed in the Declaration of Independence, laid out in the Constitution and further delineated by the amended Bill of Rights, works to create a form of government capable of sustaining a populist needs as well as satisfying their creative impulse towards self-government. The three branches, pillars, or columns of this form of constitutional government date much further back than the Senate and Plebeian Council below Caesar, and even further than the democratic reforms of the great Greek lawmaker Solon. They date back to before the original Hebrew alphabet of symbols was first written, and to before the meanings of the alchemical elements were known. The essential elements of the three-pillar model are the same as those of the scale, with, as stated by Sefer Yetzer of Kabbalah, fire as a pan of merit, water as a pan of liability, and man as the breath of air deciding between them. Not to put too trite ahead on such an important point, but the scales of justice, symbolizing the role of lawyers, judges, and jurors to weigh the good and evil traits of a suspect before convicting them of their accused crime, could not be a more clear and accurate symbol for this three-branch model for a democratic republic form of government. The scales of justice, likewise, give forth to the myriad texts of the Latinesque tongue called nowadays legalese. The sheer number of law books written in this peculiar and uniquely American language can stump the mind and confound any soul opposed to such a massive collection of documents that yet require constant rewrites and edits. Yet these law books in this neologistic dialect called legalese are even more copious than what even such a one who would be opposed to such can imagine. 
There are law books upon law books, and each changes every year. The old records remain stored and filed away. The result of this is what is called history. The records of a society's changes over time and allows one to pursue what is called a paper trail to track down the source of any replication of error. The number of these law books would be sufficient if bricks, not books, to build a mansion of a house for every lawyer, judge, and juror. Likewise, the number of redundant records describing the laws in books from past years, which law books have been changed out for currently new ones by now, can astound the mind of one who sees such a pursuit as folly with the sheer volume of its apparently useless data. The walls of our society are made of law books. Here we see some stacks from the official cataloged collection of the Library of Congress, which contains no fewer today than 32 million cataloged books and other print materials. The books in the Library of Congress include a myriad of works besides just law books. However, the law books comprise the U.S. legal code and thus are the most important ones for the individual lives of citizens living in the USA. The Library of Congress is a castle comprised of books instead of bricks, where each foundation stone conceals words describing all the tools of the craft needed to reconstruct the entire edifice. The legal code of the U.S. is a brilliant monster that cannot be defeated by any one individual outside the office of the U.S. Presidency. The Library of Congress reading room's domed ceiling arches upward dozens of feet above the floor to symbolize the holy silence of all libraries since the monastic era when scroll collections began to be stored by friars and holy orders of secluded scholastics. The feeling of floating like an angel inside libraries is not a new feeling to those who love the books they contain. The Library of Congress is a unique and blessed holy place that contains the history and laws of the entire USA. Without the Library of Congress, the rest of government could not long continue to function, nor would it have much purpose left to do so. But why must this enormous, ornate architecture structure, the Library of Congress, be built up to be so important to the functioning of the three-branched form of a democratic republic government? It is because if law books are seen as useless, then how much more so would be our baseless fiat paper cash money? The Library of Congress is the true seat of power in a democratic republic such as the USA. However, the Federal Reserve Central Bank threatens to repossess this all if we do not pay them the interest the government owes on its national debt to the Fed Bank in the form of an annual, arbitrary, and unconstitutional direct income tax. The Federal Reserve Bank and the shadow government it funds bear being brought to the light of public scrutiny in a democratic republic because they commit monetary crimes against the U.S. citizens so constantly. Although, constitutionally, the Fed should not exist in the first place, at present, we the people of the U.S. are not even allowed to know how the Federal Reserve Central Bank is spending the money it collects from us through direct taxation. Thus, the Fed remains today, in 2011, the greatest threat to personal sovereignty on the planet. Modern Politics 101b New World Order, Monetary Imperialism As we have now seen, the U.S. Constitution specifies three branches for the government of the American Democratic Republic. Regardless of not being officially sanctioned by constitutional law, corporations, using maritime laws to supplant common law, have managed to rewrite a great number of laws into forms that favored them more. This unconstitutional influence on politicians and political parties by corporations via lobbyists and special interest groups forms a fourth branch of the modern U.S. government. As if all our founding 